guard the good deposit entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Guarding the deposit of faith is the mission which the Lord has entrusted to his church and which she fulfills in every age. This treasure, received from the apostles, has been faithfully guarded by their successors. All Christ faithful are called to hand it on from generation to generation by professing the faith, by living it in fraternal sharing, and by celebrating it in liturgy and prayer. What is the importance of affirming in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth? Creation is the foundation of all God's saving plans, the beginning of the history of salvation that culminates in Christ. It is the first answer to our fundamental questions regarding our very origin and destiny. The first three chapters of the book of Genesis remain the principal source or catechesis on creation. And they teach us that God created the world and especially mankind for a noble purpose. Who created the world? St. John's Gospel tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And he goes on to say that our Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Word, is the one through whom all things were made. St. Paul in his letter to the Colossians adds that in Christ Jesus all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and in him, and he is before all, and by him all things consist or hold together. The Church reminds us that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit do all things together. The Catechism links the work of creation in a special way to the second person of the Holy Trinity, Jesus Christ. And man, who is created in the image and likeness of God, is in a special way created in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Why was the world created? God created the world to show forth His glory. He showed the goodness, the truth, and the beauty of His nature through the creation of the world. That His creatures should share in His truth, goodness, and beauty, that is the glory for which God created them. The glory of God means the showing forth of His goodness. As a great artist like Blessed Fra Angelico, expressed the goodness within him in his sacred art. In the same way or in a similar way, God shows forth his goodness, his beauty, and his truth in the things that he has created. The ultimate aim of creation is for all things to be brought to perfection in Christ and for Christ to offer them all back to the Father and to fulfill the purpose for which everything was created in the beginning. How did God create the universe? In wisdom and love, God, who is above all things, freely created out of nothing an orderly and good world which he sustains with his love. God created all things with wisdom. In the city of God, St. Saint Saint Augustine tells us that in this creation, had no one sinned, the world would have been filled and beautified with nature's good without exception. 
So all that God created in the beginning perfectly reflected his wisdom and love. To create means to produce something in its entire substance from nothing. In other words, to create means to bring something into existence with all of its parts. But to make something means to take some pre-existing material or materials and to shape or arrange them in a certain way. Man's creation from nothing is reflected in the Byzantine liturgy where the priest addresses God and says, you created man from nothing. And we find also in the second book of Maccabees, the mother of the seven martyrs tells her youngest son when he's about to give his life for his faith that he was created from nothing as were all the other creatures in the universe. Just as God spoke light into existence at the beginning of creation, so can he create a pure heart in a repentant sinner who turns to him in faith or raise a dead man to life in the twinkling of an eye. The same divine power that allowed God to create light in the darkness by his word enables him to change the substance of bread and wine into his body, blood, soul, and divinity by the words of consecration. The Catechism tells us that because creation comes forth from God's goodness, it shares in that goodness. For God willed creation as a gift addressed to man, an inheritance destined for and entrusted to him. In other words, the whole world reflects God's goodness and wisdom, but it also reflects God's love for us, because everything in the universe was made for us in Christ. The perfection of the first created world is beautifully reflected in the prayers of the sacred liturgy. We find in the prayers of the Byzantine liturgy, for example, this beautiful prayer, O oh God, when you created all things in perfection, you fashioned me a man. On the one hand, God's love makes him present to us in all things, and especially in each other. On the other hand, God's greatness is unsearchable. Both God's greatness and his love for creatures can be seen in the way he upholds and sustains his creation. What is divine providence? We call divine providence the way that God guides the world, guides creation to its final perfection. Now the first perfection of the universe, St. Thomas tells us in the Summa Theologica, was the completeness of the universe at its first founding. How do we collaborate with divine providence? We do this in two ways. First, by obeying the teachings of the church, fulfilling the duties of our state in life, and following the inspirations of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, by abandoning ourselves to the will of God, especially in the trials and sufferings of life. If God the Father Almighty, the creator of the ordered and good world, cares for all his creatures, why does evil exist? The key to the answer to this question can be found in paragraph 311 of the Catechism, where we read, Angels and men, as intelligent and free creatures, have to journey toward their ultimate destinies by their free choice and preferential love. They can therefore go astray. It would have been impossible for angels and men to be created free without having the ability to choose evil. Had God created them without that ability, they would have been robots, not free and rational creatures. And we know that both the angels and Adam and Eve, our first parents in the beginning, chose against the will of God. However, we also know that from evil, God is able to bring forth good. Indeed, from the greatest moral evil ever committed, the rejection and murder of the Son of God, God brought forth the greatest good 
the redemption and salvation of the world. What did God create? The Nicene Creed explicitly teaches that God created all things, visible and invisible. And the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 elaborates that God created all the spiritual and the corporeal creatures at once from the beginning of time and then man. Man sums up in himself the spiritual and the corporeal orders of the created world as the crowning work of creation. By nature, angels are pure spirits with a mind and a free will. But St. Augustine teaches that the office or mission of the angels is to be messengers between God and man and servants of mankind. Christ is the center of the angelic world. They are His angels. They belong to Him because they were created through Him and for Him. The whole life of the Church benefits from the mysterious and powerful help of the angels. In the liturgy, we join with the angels in heaven in worshiping God thrice holy. Beside each believer stands an angel as protector and shepherd, leading him to life. In addition to the invisible world of the angels, God created the world of visible creatures, the material universe. Each one of these creatures reflects in its own way a ray of God's goodness and beauty. And these creatures together make up the visible world, the material part of creation. The Catechism also speaks of the interdependence of all creatures as part of God's grand design for the universe. And scientists continually discover new examples of interdependence and cooperation among different kinds of creatures. Consider the relationship between the yucca plant and the yucca moth, for example. The yucca plant can only be pollinated by one insect, the yucca moth, because the nectar glands of this orchid can only be reached by the proboscis or sucking mouth part of this moth. Likewise, the yucca moth requires the yucca plant for its reproductive cycle and for food. When the moth visits the yucca flower, it collects pollen and carries the tiny pollen balls from plant to plant. After the female lays her four to five eggs in the yucca flower's ovary, she deposits her pollen ball on the tip of the flower's pistil, thus pollinating the yucca flower. The seeds then start developing at the same time the moth larvae develop. The seeds are the only source of food for the larvae. These seeds were made possible only by the pollen the female moth had earlier deposited. The larvae eat about half of the 200 seeds produced. The yucca plant could not survive without the yucca moth, and the yucca moth could not survive without the yucca plant. Creation is full of marvelous examples of this kind of pre-programmed unity among all creatures. The Catechism also draws our attention to the beauty of the universe, which reflects the beauty of the Creator. St. Basil summed up the teaching of all of the Church Fathers when he wrote, Let us glorify the Master Craftsman for all that has been done wisely and skillfully, and from the beauty of the visible things, let us form an idea of Him who is more than beautiful. The Catechism also reflects on the hierarchy or order among the various kinds of creatures. St. Athanasius teaches that the wisdom of God holds the world like a lyre and joins things in the air to those on earth and things in heaven to those in the air and brings each part into harmony with the whole. By his decree and will, he regulates them all to produce the beauty and harmony of a single, well-ordered universe. And as the image of Christ, man is exalted above all other creatures. There is a solidarity among creatures that flows from their all having a common creator. Saint Theophilus of Antioch, 
one of the first bishops of the church founded by St. Peter, explains that man's exalted role in creation means that his good or bad behavior has profound consequences for the lower creatures. According to St. Theophilus, the animals are named wild beasts from their being hunted, not as if they had been made evil or venomous from the first, for nothing was made evil by God, but all things good, yea, very good, but the sin in which man was concerned brought evil upon them. Pope Benedict XVI reminds us that man and the wild beasts were friends in the original creation. He writes, In his short account of the temptations, Mark brings into relief the parallels between Adam and Jesus. Jesus, we read, was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. The desert, the opposite image of the garden, becomes the place of reconciliation and healing. Wild beasts are the most concrete threat that the rebellion of creation and the power of death pose to man. But here they become man's friends, as they once were in paradise. Peace is restored. The peace that Isaiah proclaims for the days of the Messiah. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Once sin has been overcome and man's harmony with God restored, creation is reconciled too. The sacred text of Genesis relates that on the seventh day God finished his work which he had done, that the heavens and the earth were finished, and that God rested on this day and sanctified and blessed it. The Catechism tells us that creation was fashioned with a view to the Sabbath and that worship is inscribed in the order of creation. This is why St. Benedict says in his rule that nothing should take precedence over the work of God by which he means liturgical worship. A covenant is a pledge of total commitment between two parties. The Sabbath is the sign of the eternal covenant between God and man. It is a time to renew our covenant with God, to set aside all of our earthly cares and concerns and to worship Him. The seventh day completed the first creation but our Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead on Easter Sunday, the first day of the week, which then became the eighth day, the beginning of a new creation. And this is why, especially in the early church, so many baptismal fonts were octagonal, eight-sided, because those who were baptized into Christ were understood to be baptized into the eighth day. The first creation finds its meaning and its summit in the new creation in Christ. What is the place of the human person in creation? Man occupies a unique place in creation. He is in the image of God. In his own nature, he unites the spiritual and material worlds. He is created male and female, and God established him in his friendship. The human person, created in the image of God, is a being at once corporeal and spiritual. Man, whole and entire, is therefore willed by God. The church teaches that the human soul is the form of the human body. The form means that it's the soul that meaningfully arranges the material parts of the human body. So the human body is not a collection of parts which were cobbled together one at a time. It's a unity from the very beginning of man's creation. The unity of soul and body is so profound. It is because of its spiritual soul that the body made of matter becomes a living human body. Spirit and matter in man are not two natures united, but rather their union forms a single nature. The church teaches that every spiritual soul is created immediately by God. It is not produced by the parents, and also that it is immortal. It does not perish when it separates from the body at death, and it will be reunited with the body at the final resurrection. 
Man is the only creature on earth that God created for his own sake. Only man was made to offer everything in creation back to God. Only he is called to share by knowledge and love in God's own life. This is why St. Catherine of Siena says to God about man's soul, By love you created her. By love you have given her a being capable of tasting your eternal good. In what sense do we understand man and woman created in the image and likeness of God? Genesis 1.27 tells us, In the image of God he created man, male and female he created them. In this verse, the name of God is the Hebrew word Elohim, a plural noun which the Church has seen as an early indication of the Most Holy Trinity. In a similar way, the singular noun man is divided up into male and female, which points to a similarity between the unity and trinity in God and the unity and multiplicity in mankind. In Genesis 2, the similarity between the unity and trinity in God and the unity and multiplicity in humanity is elaborated when Adam is created from the dust of the earth and Eve from Adam's side. Being in the image of God, every human being bears the dignity of a person. So he is not just some thing, he is someone. He is capable of self-knowledge, self-possession, and of freely giving himself and entering into communion with other persons. Man and woman have been created, which is to say willed by God, on the one hand in perfect equality as human persons, on the other in their respective beings as man and woman. Man and woman are both with one and the same dignity in the image of God. In no way is God in man's image. He is neither man nor woman. God is a pure spirit and is neither male nor female. However, the perfections of man and woman reflect something of the infinite perfection of God, those of a mother and those of a husband and father. For what purpose did God create man and woman? Man and woman were made for each other. God created them to be a communion of persons in which each can be a helpmate to the other, for they are equal as persons and complementary as masculine and feminine. In marriage, God unites them in such a way that by forming one flesh, they can transmit human life. By transmitting human life to their descendants, Man and woman as spouses and parents cooperate in a unique way in the Creator's work. In God's plan, man and woman have the vocation of subduing the earth as stewards of God. This sovereignty is not to be an arbitrary and destructive domination. God calls man and woman, made in the image of the Creator who loves everything that exists, to share in His providence toward other creatures. Hence their responsibility for the world God has entrusted to them. In Preface 5 of the Sundays in Ordinary Time, we pray, For you laid the foundations of the world and have arranged the changing of the seasons. You formed man in your own image and set humanity over the whole world in all its wonder to rule in your name over all you have made and forever praise you in your mighty works through Christ our Lord. Why does the human race form a unity? In his famous sermon to the people of Athens in Greece, St. Paul taught that God hath made of one all mankind to dwell upon the whole face of the earth, determining appointed times and the limits of their habitation. The Catechism makes reference to the book of Tobit, where we read that God made Adam and gave him his wife Eve to be his help and support, 
and from these two the human race descended. Thus we know that every human being on earth is related to every other human being through our common descent from our first parents, Adam and Eve. What was the original condition of the human person according to the plan of God? The original condition of the human person according to the plan of God is reflected in the exalted holiness of Adam and Eve before the fall. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve in a state of perfect harmony with God, with creation, and with each other. Moreover, God created them in a state of perfect inner harmony so that their bodies were completely under the control of their reason and all of their faculties worked in harmony with each other in perfect submission to the divine will. In this original state of holiness and justice, Adam and Eve shared in the divine life. So long as they remained in union with God, Adam and Eve could have retained all of their gifts and passed them on to their children. There would have been no human death, deformity, or disease, no mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual suffering. Recalling this, the church prays, It is right to celebrate the wonders of your providence, by which you call human nature back to its original holiness and bring it to experience on this earth the gifts you promise in the new world to come. How should we understand the reality of sin? Sin is a violation of our relationship with God. It's a rejection of God, an opposition to God in thought, word, action, or intention. There are many evils in the world, but none of them compares to the evil of sin, which is the source of all evils. Without the knowledge that Revelation gives us of God, we cannot recognize sin clearly and are tempted to explain it as merely a developmental flaw, a psychological weakness, a mistake, or the necessary consequence of an inadequate social structure. Only in the knowledge of God's plan for man can we grasp that sin is an abuse of the freedom that God gives to created persons so that they are capable of loving Him and each other. What was the fall of the angels? The Fourth Lateran Council, the Council of Florence, and the First Vatican Council all teach that God created the angels good, but some of them rebelled against God and became devils. Scripture witnesses to the disastrous influence of the one Jesus calls a murderer from the beginning, who would even try to divert Jesus from the mission received from his Father. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. In its consequences, the gravest of these works was the mendacious seduction that led men to disobey God. Indeed, the power of God is infinitely greater than that of the devil, who is powerful from the fact that he is a pure spirit, but he is still only a creature. What was the first human sin? According to the Catechism, the account of the fall in Genesis 3 uses figurative language but affirms a primeval event, a deed that took place at the beginning of the history of man. Revelation gives us the certainty of faith that the whole of human history is marked by the original fault freely committed by our first parents. God created man in his image and established him in his friendship. A spiritual creature, man can live this friendship only in free submission to God. The prohibition against eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil spells this out. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolically evokes the insurmountable limits that man, being a creature, must freely recognize and respect with trust. Man is dependent on his Creator 
and subject to the laws of creation and to the moral norms that govern the use of freedom. Man tempted by the devil, let his trust in his Creator die in his heart, and abusing his freedom, disobeyed God's command. This is what man's first sin consisted of. All subsequent sin would be disobedience toward God and lack of trust in his goodness. What is original sin? How did the sin of Adam become the sin of all his descendants? The whole human race is in Adam as one body of one man. By this unity of the human race, all men are implicated in Adam's sin, as all are implicated in Christ's justice. Still, the transmission of original sin is a mystery that we cannot fully understand. But we do know by revelation that Adam had received original holiness and justice, not for himself alone, but for all human nature. By yielding to the tempter, Adam and Eve committed a personal sin, but this sin affected the human nature that they would then transmit in a fallen state. It is a sin which will be transmitted by propagation to all mankind, that is, by the transmission of a human nature deprived of original holiness and justice. And that is why original sin is called sin only in an analogical sense. It is a sin contracted and not committed, a state and not an act. God did not create our first parents subject to evils such as suffering, ignorance, death, and selfishness. All of these are the result not of God's design, but of our sin. First, the sin of Adam that resulted in our being conceived in the state of original sin, and secondly, our own personal sins, which increase our slavery to ignorance, suffering, sickness, and selfishness. Baptism, by imparting the life of Christ's grace, erases original sin and turns a man back toward God. But the consequences for his nature, weakened and inclined to evil, persist in him and summon him to spiritual battle. The consequences of original sin and of all men's personal sins put the world as a whole in a sinful condition aptly described by St. John as the sin of the world. The whole of man's history has been the story of dour combat with the powers of evil, stretching, so our Lord tells us, from the very dawn of history until the last day. Finding himself in the midst of the battlefield, man has to struggle to do what is right, and it is at great cost to himself and aided by God's grace that he succeeds in achieving his own inner integrity. Ignorance of the fact that man has a wounded nature inclined to evil gives rise to serious errors in the areas of education, politics, social action, and morals. What is death? God did not make death. He takes no delight in the death of the living. It was through the envy of the devil that death entered the world. In his first letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul tells us that death is not a normal or natural part of human life. It is an enemy. And he tells us that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. According to the Catechism, the Church's magisterium as authentic interpreter of Scripture and tradition teaches that death entered the world on account of man's sin. God did not plan for man to die. This is why bodily death, from which man would have been immune had he not sinned, is the last enemy of man left to be conquered. St. Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans, chapter 8, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. 
For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning with labor pains together until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. St. John Chrysostom explains that the first human sin not only introduced corruption and death into the incorruptible bodies of Adam and Eve, but also made the whole creation subject to corruption. He writes, What does St. Paul mean when he writes, For the creation was made subject to futility? It became corruptible. Why and by what cause? By your fault, O man. Because you received a body mortal and subject to sufferings, so the earth also was subject to a curse and brought forth thorns and thistles. Pope Benedict XVI quoted an ancient homily on this theme which points out that Adam was created pure by God to serve him. All creatures were created for the service of man. He was destined to be Lord and King over all creatures. But when he embraced evil, he did so by listening to something outside of himself. This penetrated his heart and took over his whole being. Thus ensnared by evil, creation which had assisted and served him was ensnared together with him. After the first sin, what did God do? The church fathers observed that death was not only a punishment for sin, but also a mercy, because it saved Adam and Eve and their descendants from unending suffering. As St. Ephraim the Syrian teaches, God banished Adam and Eve from paradise and from the tree of life, lest having eaten of this tree, Adam and Eve would live forever and remain in eternal lives of suffering. Pope Benedict XVI elaborated on the medicinal character of the curse in his 2012 Ash Wednesday homily. Speaking of God's words to Adam after his sin, Dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return, the Pope observed that the earth participates in man's destiny. In one of his homilies, St. John Chrysostom says, See how after his disobedience, everything is imposed on man in a way that is contrary to his previous style of life. This cursing of the ground has a medicinal function for man who learns from the earth's resistance to recognize his limitations and his own human nature. From this we can learn that God is always able to bring good out of evil. No matter how badly we abuse our freedom, God is always ready to pour out his mercy upon us, to show us a way out of our misery, and to heal the wounds we have inflicted upon ourselves and upon others through our sins. From the beginning of salvation history, God gave hope to Adam and Eve and their descendants by prophesying the coming of the Redeemer. In the so-called Proto-Evangelium, or first gospel, recorded in Genesis 3.15, God predicted the advent of the Messiah, the new Adam and Redeemer, and of his mother who would be conceived without original sin. Pope St. Leo the Great observed, that there is nothing to prevent human nature to be taken up to something better even after sin. God permits evil to be able to draw forth some greater good. This is why at the Easter Vigil the exultant sings, O happy fault, which gained for us so great a Redeemer. For we know it belongs to your boundless glory that you came to the aid of mortal beings with your divinity and even fashioned for us a remedy out of mortality itself, that the cause of our downfall might become the means of our salvation through Christ our Lord, so that you might love in us what you loved in your Son, by whose obedience 
we have been restored to those gifts of yours that by sinning we had lost in disobedience. It is Jesus, the last Adam, who tramples down death by death on the tree of the cross and restores to us the tree of life in the form of the most holy Eucharist. In this way, Jesus destroys the power of Satan over us. As St. John of Damascus teaches, he who once assumed the appearance of a malignant serpent and implanted death in the creation is now cast into darkness by Christ's coming in the flesh. The joy of the church at Christ's redeeming work resounds in the Easter chant of the Byzantine liturgy. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and to those in the tomb bestowing life. Alleluia. What is the final destiny of the created universe? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Christ's purpose was to restore to us what we had lost in Adam, that what we had lost in Adam we might recover in Christ Jesus. Indeed, the Church pleads for this glorious restoration in all of her liturgical prayers. For with the old order restored, a universe cast down is renewed, and integrity of life is restored to us in Christ. And in the fourth Eucharistic prayer of the Roman Rite, the priest prays in the name of the whole Church, To all of us, your children, grant, O merciful Father, that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and with your apostles and saints in your kingdom. There, with the whole of creation, freed from the corruption of sin and death, may we glorify you through Christ our Lord. <laughs>